and and actually some companies like Starbucks have huge loss leaders and oh yeah if, if you take some of those elements out in isolation you don't fully understand what's going on there it's really easy to talk yourself into bankruptcy effectively Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Ford, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode one of a new five part series where we are talking about big brands versus indie cafes or independent cafes. Kind of what are the pros and cons of each of those sides of the uh, industry? And joining me for this series is Erin Hassan. Erin, uh, Welcome to the podcast for the first time. This is uh, this is one of those conversations that came off a meeting where you and I were going to catch up to meet for the first time and it turned into a two-hour conversation of what was supposed to be yeah. a half-hour meeting. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice, right, when you, um, when, you, when you jump on for a little, little chat and then you realize you've been talking for two and a half hours. Yeah, that's uh, great. And, and it didn't feel like it, yeah. Not at all. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, why don't you tell people what you do? Yeah, sure. So um, I don't want to bore people too much, but just to, um, to give a rough overview, uh, I, I'm the director of a company called Cade Sales, and we've um, we've been in the industry for 25 years this year, and we set up uh, typically small small brands or uh, small multiples. And have been, uh, we've gone through like over 3000 sites now. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we brand them, we do the interior design for them, we manufacture and then we fit out, but, um, we're really an insight driven company. So we do a lot to keep up to date with what's going on in the market. We see a lot of what succeeds and, and what doesn't. So I'm here to give you my two pennies worth on uh, this quite controversial topic. I think there's going to be some things that are said that maybe some people won't agree with. And that's the great thing about conversations like this, right? Like everyone has an opinion. Some people are more stubborn than others when it comes to this. Uh, something that we value at Maple Forward and that we encourage is openness. And so when it comes to these kinds of topics, when we're looking at the difference between commercial companies, um, like the big brands and independent, they all have things that are foreign against them. And there's an opportunity cost to everything that we do when it comes to business. So I'm really excited at, about exploring uh, what some of those pros and cons are. In this episode, we're going to talk about what makes a big brand big. So we'll, yeah, talk talk to us about that specific thing. Like what's a big brand and what makes it big in your okay. mind? Yeah, so I think um, I've been thinking about this for a, a little while because it's quite it is quite subjective, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, is a big brand over 50 stores, 100 stores, 1,000 stores, et cetera. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of context to the conversation just because some people may not be aware of it, but the, the global market is kind of $130 billion-ish in dollars, um, and the numbers vary from source to the source. But, um, and we're not going to get very far in this conversation without the S word, unfortunately. So <laughs> Starbucks had to come out. Oh, bring um, it on. <laughs> the, their, their turnover is uh i mean it's around 35 billion right right so you've you've got a uh, a total market of 130 starbucks is a huge portion of that it's like yeah. nearly a quarter so um they're they're definitely going to be in that big brand category and i think they're definitely going to be a base point for us in terms of referencing back because yep. they're present in so many countries and they're a really good reference point for us um I, I kind of feel like a big brand is a brand that utilizes vertical integration within mm -hmm. the industry. So if you're at the stage where you've got a number of outlets and you're then going from cherry to cut, then you're probably falling into the big brand category. And there, there are some specialty brands that are doing that, but um, not on, on any real scale um, where they've got their own roasteries rather than using a master roaster, for example. And I right. think that's probably the key difference. Interested to hear your take on it as well, actually. But, and before we do that, though, why don't you help people understand who've never heard that term before, vertical integration? Help them understand a, with a little bit more depth what that means. Sure. So um, I think over the course of the series, we'll talk a little bit about vertical and horizontal integration. Mm -hmm. So um, vertical integration means uh, it's when a company is taking on different um, portions of the market that is within that market's supply chain. So 
for a coffee for the coffee industry, for example, it would be if if the if the core business is a coffee shop, then it would be taking on the roaster, for example, which is upstream of mm -hmm. of, of the coffee shop, and then beyond that, it'd be taking on a farm, which is upstream of roaster, or or should I say an importer and then a farm. Um, so upstream is back to source, and downstream is to, towards the customer. Consumer. And then horizontal integrations are where we have parallel markets, which are seemingly unrelated, um, but they they work well together. So the, the great one for the coffee industry is is the retail sector, and mm. so uh, retail and food to go or or, or uh, dine in even they're yeah. they're two different markets, but they can integrate, and that will be a horizontal market integration. You know what often um, gets me thinking is the way that we define a coffee shop, right? Yeah, that's a can uh, of worms. <laughs> it's totally a can of worms, but it, it's really important in this conversation because, you know, I lived in America for a long time, and but I grew up in like uh, professionally. I uh, the Australian coffee industry is what raised me in this industry, and the way that. Australia defines cafe versus the way that America defines cafe or coffee shop, very, very different business models. So, for example, in Sydney, you might find maybe two tops, two coffee shops that only serve coffee and nothing else sure. of all the hundreds of cafes. Whereas in America, uh, that's a lot more accepted that if you go into a coffee shop or a cafe, it serves coffee and maybe a couple of pastries, tops. And this is a, a real distinct difference between the two markets. How do you think that that plays into uh, the role that a, a big company like Starbucks plays in influencing a market? And even a company like Dunkin' Donuts, which, which is another one of oh, the yeah, big, or Costa, Costa yeah. in, um, in the UK. Like all of these, Cafe Nero, all, all of these kinds of brands really have an important role to help define what cafe means in that local market, no matter whether it's an independent or a bigger brand. Yeah, I think um, I think what they do really well is they they benchmark for the society and for that culture what cafe means. Mm. So they they say we are a cafe, we're a coffee shop. Like mm -hmm. that's our tagline, and this is what we do. And mm. generally, the public just accept that as 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 read. So then for everyone else that operates around the market, um, they're either doing less food and more focused on coffee, in which case straight away people are thinking, oh, they're more of a specialist coffee shop, kind mm. of a bit more speciality because they don't do all the other stuff. Um, or the other end, they're, they're having more of a substantial food offering. Um, and then people think, oh, it's a, it's a coffee shop, but it's more almost, almost kind of bridging over to QSR or um, casual dining, um, mm. and it's it's really difficult to define what a coffee shop is. It's like, um, is my cafe a coffee shop? I they would don't argue market yes. Themselves well, they, but they don't market themselves as a coffee shop. I mean, the the name is McCafe, but their primary product is food. Yet yeah, they are, off the top of my head, sixth or seventh biggest for sales mm. globally for coffee. Um, and actually, uh, just a McDonald's are also the the largest global retailer for toys, and that and and that plays through into that their little Happy, happy Meal through, thing. Happy is. Meals, yeah, yeah. No yeah. way, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing fact, and you just think that it's not their market, but it kind of is. So when you're talking about what is a coffee shop, that's really difficult because you have got people like the cafe who are primarily a food seller. Mm. They're, I mean, they're QSR though. Everyone, you know, McDonald's is is a beast at that. But they're doing a huge trade in terms of coffee. So do you call them coffee shop? Do you call them QSR? Or are they right. both? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And and the interesting thing is like you look at a company like Starbucks and even they do quick service, right? However, yeah. however, when we're talking about uh, horizontal integration, Starbucks had a record label. Yeah. And a publishing company, right? Like that's, uh, and they were using their cafes to sell CDs. And I remember when I was in the music industry, I pitched to put my album in Starbucks. Like it's the, 
that's the kind of when when I talk to clients about expanding revenue streams these are the kinds of people that we should be benchmarking against and saying well you know Starbucks is looking at uh, including juice bars in their cafes is that a viable proposition for a cafe and a lot of clients are like but I'm not in the business of juice bars I'm like you're not really just in the business of coffee either you're in the business of business yeah absolutely yeah and the the big brands I think um they make those things okay they're, they're often they often just um, create a pathway for other businesses to. I mean, it's actually a double edged sword. We've we've spoken before about the the danger of that success um, kind of uh, guaranteed success feeling that yeah. you just say, oh well, they're doing it, so it must be successful. And actually, success fallacy, like right? Success fallacy, yeah. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Mapper Forward's first on-demand workshop, How to Become a Coffee Consultant, available now online for you to learn at your own pace with a certificate available upon completion. Click the link in the show notes to access today for just 50 euros. And and actually some companies like Starbucks have huge loss leaders. And oh, yeah. if, if you take some of those elements out in isolation, you don't fully understand what's going on there it's really easy to talk yourself into bankruptcy effectively um but going back to what i was just saying they what they do really well is they just create that pathway and they make that that avenue accessible and accepted um and something that i don't think they're given enough credit for is actually paving the way for the price um mm. because in 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 so many markets i mean like in the states before starbucks kicked off it was all Lots of black coffee, really bad quality. Um, in the UK, it was instant. Um, and actually, there was a period of time where those stores were concentrated in the major cities, and you drive a couple of hours out, and coffee was like a pound or the equivalent of you know dollar yeah. fifty. Um, but all of a sudden, when those big brands start to roll out and they go all the way up and down the country or across, across continents. They give customers a an acceptance of a general base level of pricing, right? Which has really actually given an opportunity to the independent market to be profitable, mm-hmm. because they haven't got the economies of scale that those big brands have, and it gives them the opportunity to charge, you know, a fraction more or a fraction less depending on where they're positioning their brand, and and for it to be accepted if they're in outside of a major city, so. There's, there's that aspect as well, which they're not giving credit for, really. Um, yeah, and it, and the the big challenge is for the, anyone listening who is bench, benchmarking their pricing against anybody else, I don't care who it is, if you are setting your prices based on what everybody else is pricing it, uh, I want to be very clear in letting you know that you should probably get a consultant to help you with that. That is yeah, the wrong way yeah. to price your product. You need to understand your financials and how much it's costing you to run your business before you can even come close to understanding how much you should be charging for a cup of coffee or for a bag of roasted coffee. Um, so it's just the lazy that, way of doing it, right? <laughs> and the dangerous way of doing it. Really, yeah. really dangerous but way of doing it. There's, um, uh, Maxwell uh, from Kelowna and Smalls has just released a book, uh, mm-hmm. The Business of Speciality Coffee. Um, and he's he's there's an interesting portion of that which talks about price point and pricing just from mm-hmm. the avenue that you've spoken about. And it questions actually whether, okay, you understand your cost base and you talk about um, uh, this coffee is costing the X amount to deliver because of the amount of time we're putting into it and the amount of... Um, high quality products and the machinery that we've got, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that coffee then comes out at seven or eight pounds. Um, doesn't make it justified to be that price. So it's absolutely that exercise has to be done. And then you also have to look at that through the lens of, is it, is it worth that money to my client as well? Because there's, right. there's that aspect of just feeling like, but it's worth this because it's got this level of quality in it and this level of input. You know, we've right. got twice the amount of labour in it than than Starbucks do. That doesn't matter. The customer takes it and then puts a couple of sugars on it and the on the on the side. It's really yeah, that's really key. And and the the part of that that is the it's the starting point. 
right? Like once you've understood that if I'm going to charge the right price for the coffee that I want to make, it starts at seven pounds or uh, I've done this with a lot of clients and it usually ends up somewhere around 13 US dollars. Yeah. And then the assessment needs to be made of how do I tweak my workflow to bring that cost down? How do I tweak my uh, my costings to bring that down? But also how do I uh, improve my revenue so that that brings that cost down? How do I make sure that I have a clear understanding of what my customer acquisition plan is so that my overall business cost, my operating expenses are, are brought down? down or my revenue is increased so that I can cover more of those expenses. It's the 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 basic takeaway is you know the the big brands if we're using their pricing models to make our our independent cafes uh, make sense it, it's apples and oranges. Like they have so much more ca- access to capital and you know, really interesting thing about those big brands. We're going to take Starbucks, for example, before we wrap up the the episode. Those cards that you load up for Starbucks have essentially turned Starbucks into an investment bank. And what happens is you put twenty dollars on your Starbucks card. Uh, the, that has put something like thirty three million dollars into an invest like a capital that's just sitting there they're using that money they're investing that money and then they're taking the profits of that money and reinvesting it into their own company so again this is that horizontal integration yeah or um a slightly different take on it is that they are rather than turning into an investment bank they're actually using all their customers as like a crowdfunding borrowing yeah. service and the only interest that they're paying is the extra free coffee that they give you for using yeah. that Exactly. Which it's, is pretty cheap lending, like in terms oh, of global lending. Free I wish money. I could borrow on my house for um, right. a few free coffees. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And look, they, they take that. They either invested in shares. There's lots of great uh, podcasts out there that talk about this. Um, but they take it, they spend it on either investing in um, on the stock market, they invest in, in bonds, uh, they invest in buying coffee farms. Um a really a, a podcast that I want to recommend uh, is for people to go and listen to Business Wars and the series on Business Wars that specifically talks about the rise of Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts and it is fantastic. It's a whole season of podcasts that go into meticulous detail about how these two uh, really kind of uh, became each other's competitors and, and rose through the ranks together to become – Essentially, they're both buying specialty coffee. So yeah. they were the benchmarks for what specialty coffee became. So, folks, the next step is – go on, go on. Sorry, I was going to say, just finally, um, if if people are wondering, is that big brand, is it not big brand, we're trying to define it as best we can. Um, there's 50% of the market share globally is held by 20 brands. Yeah, so yeah. if you're not in the top 20 – you're not a big brand. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's kind of an easy way to summarize it. <laughs> yeah. Your eight stores aren't getting you there. <laughs> yeah. Or even your hundred, which is really yeah, yeah. tricky. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in the next episode, folks, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of being a big brand. So join us in the next episode. Peace, love and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.